All right, welcome to the Quick Media Come Follow Me series. We are covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 71 through 75. Opening up here with 71, this is given December 1st, 1831. Here again, the prophet is at the Johnson uh, uh, Farm in Hiram, Ohio. He is with Sidney Rigdon, and they are translating the Bible. This is still ongoing. He never really finishes off what he wants to do with this. He, 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 has, he gets a lot of this done, but he never really, really finishes this. Keep in mind, according to my King James Version of the Bible, adding both, of course, the Old and New Testaments together, you have about 1,589 pages of translation that he's going through. And it's not a matter of just the pages of the Bible that he's translating. Think about the Book of Moses and what he gets with that. That's an, that's, that's an entire, entirely new story that we get above and beyond what's even in the uh, uh, what, what's in the scriptures and in that that's the case not quite as much in other places but in other places in the Bible he's adding quite a bit in there so it's not an easy thing but the environment here in Kirtland and in Ohio is is getting a little bit testy right with 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 uh, uh, the other citizens around them what happens is that remember Ezra Booth, Ezra Booth uh, turns on the church. He's one of the elders that had gone down to Independence, Missouri, to Zion, and came back up in the canoe. He was one of the problems. Remember, we talked about the some of the elders. They had some issues with not seeing enough signs. They were expecting to have the all of these miracles come uh, before them, and the veil open up, and, and it didn't happen. And so he's being very negative. That's one of the reasons in this this trip back up on the canoes that they have all these dark feelings and it's it's Ezra Booth is one of these problems. Remember, they see the destroyer on on the water, or W.W. Uh, w. Phelps does, but he's turned on the church and he's printing pamphlets and things that are uh, going against the church and he's teaching against the church to the other citizens of Ohio in the area. He's joined by Simon's writer, who is another. Uh, um, defector, so to speak, from from the church. Um, they misspelled his name on something, and so that ended up being something that completely turned him. How can a prophet allow this? Remember how we get into these talks sometimes, these talks, these conversations, these thoughts of how fallible is a prophet? We just spoke about this a little bit a, a week or two ago on Joseph Smith and the people that would have been around him. He's not perfect. He would have had many, many mistakes every day, and you might question yourself sometimes, is he a prophet? Right? It's, it's, uh, th- that would be normal to think, and it would require an exercise of faith being around him, I think. And, of course, at, from time and again, there's, there's revelation and there's amazing miracles and visions and different things that happen. But day to day could be a bit of an issue, and, and, and Simon's writer here has an issue because they misspelled his name. So the two of them are out really bad-mouthing the church, and things aren't good. So Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon are, are needed to go out and smooth things out, get in front of the people, especially Joseph, face-to-face and talk to them and make sure that there aren't issues there. So that's what we get here with, with section 71. That is the context for this revelation. Let's go to verse 1 here. Behold, thus saith the Lord unto you, my servants, Joseph Smith Jr. and Sidney Rigdon, that the time has verily come that it is necessary and expedient in me that you should open your mouths in proclaiming the gospel, the things of the kingdom, expounding mysteries thereof out of the scriptures, according to that portion of spirit and power, which shall be given unto you, even as I will. This is something that is right up Joseph's alley, right? Think about, again, just think about what he's done with the Bible. How, it's not just a matter of inspiration in the Holy Ghost. Think about his study as he's going through all of this and praying about every chapter, every verse in 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 the Bible here. So he's he's... He, it's very fresh in his mind to be able to go out and preach the Bible 
out to the citizens here of Ohio. Verse 4, Wherefore labor ye in my vineyard, call upon the inhabitants of the earth, and bear record and prepare the way for the commandments and revelations which are to come. Higher in the lower laws there. And then we get this law of abundance again. We've gone over this several times, and the Lord has given this to us several times. Verse 5, Now behold, this is wisdom. Whoso readeth, let him understand and receive also. So there's that, that word receive. You need to receive it. For unto him that receiveth it shall be given more abundantly even power. So if we open our hearts, we bring in the revelations, then we get even more, we are given more abundantly. It's like the spiritual capital. The more we use that, the more we get back in return. The law of abundance or law of spiritual abundance. Verse 7, wherefore confound your enemies, call upon them to meet you both in public and in private, and inasmuch as ye are faithful, their shame shall be made manifest. So this is where, uh, especially with Joseph here, we might have sometimes a hard time with this. How much do we each know about the scriptures? How much are we able to confound our enemies? Uh, We need to be close to the Spirit. That's the most important thing, but we also need knowledge. And so they have this, and Sidney Rigdon certainly has this as well. So they're going to go out, and they're going to confound their enemies, and they're going to, um, some would be enemies, and others, they're mostly just trying to go out and make sure that there's friendship there, that they understand where the Latter-day Saints are coming from, that they are not the enemies. But I like what is said here, and this is something that I try to do, uh, that I think it's important, especially going into the times that we're going into right now, uh, with the decline of religion, the decline of faith, the decline of the family. He says here in verse 8, Wherefore, let them bring forth their strong reasons against the Lord. Verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, There is no weapon that is formed against you shall, pro- shall prosper. Right? So uh, nothing is going to stop the work. And we need to always know that. Nothing will stop the work. We can always have hope in the work moving forward. Continuing here, if any man lift his voice against you, he shall be confounded in mine own due time. Wherefore, keep my commandments. They are true and faithful. Okay, so that's part of what I try to do here with this series, with with the Come Follow Me series. I hope that we are, it's not, I don't think it's enough to just know for yourself. It can't just be um, um, personal scripture study, that is. right. It can't just be personal. It, it's got to be, we are no longer in a time where we are learning for ourselves only. We've got to be able to learn, uh, absorb proper principles and the word of God and be able to expound on it and be able to convince and be able to bring the Spirit based on our knowledge. Hopefully, this series gives you a little bit more of that. Then we get back to a stewardship. And I I would say that each of us, with even that knowledge of the gospel that we have, this is looking at section 72, we have a stewardship. That could be part of our calling in the ward, or it's a knowledge of who we are, or it's our role as a parent, or a sibling, or a friend uh, as a child. A, a, a son or daughter to somebody. Here's what verse three, verses three and four say. And verily in this thing ye have done wisely, for it is required of the Lord at the hand of every steward to render an account of his stewardship both in time and in eternity. We are responsible for opportunities that are given to us and for the roles that we are given, the stewardship that we are given. I think we're moving into a time right now where we see all these declines as I covered, but part of that certainly is the decline of personal responsibility. We see that in so many places, right? It's, it's, it's much more in fashion today to be a victim than it is to be responsible. It's much more fashionable today to fight for rights and not to 
exercise your duties and to hold them close and to and to work on those responsibilities and those duties. And I think that's a good thing to think about when a social situation comes up, either personal or something that you see, and there's that idea of victimhood, and, and it's not like there, there, like there aren't victims. There are, of course. But it's, it, if that reigns supreme, then, then you've got a values hierarchy problem. There's an issue. You can't remain a victim. You just can't, and you can't glory in it. it it's, it's horrible, bankrupt capital to hang on to victimhood. And when someone is fighting for rights, I think that's great. But a, a worthy response, I think, would to something like that would be great. That, that sounds good that you're fighting for that. What about your duties? What are your responsibilities? What are your duties? And how are you carrying those out? That, that's important to me if I see a situation like that. And that's a big distinguisher between attitudes of people. We're told based on our stewardship and how we carry that out in verse 4, for he who is faithful and wise in time is accounted worthy to inherit the mansions prepared for him of my father. Again, the, the works versus grace. Well, you have to have both. It's not one or the other. And based on your faithfulness, you are given the mansion prepared for you. And, and that's with anything, based on your actions, based on your faith, based on your obedience, the rewards come after that. I do think here at the end, this is interesting. Those that are, there's certain people that are called to go to Zion, right, from Ohio here. And, and get what they say here. Get what the Lord says here to, to Joseph Smith. He, it says, verses, the last three verses here. It says, a few words in addition to the laws of the kingdom respecting the members of the church. They that are appointed by the Holy Ghost to go up unto Zion, and they who are privileged to go up unto Zion, let them carry up unto the bishop a certificate from three elders of the church or a certi certificate from the bishop. Otherwise, he who shall go up unto the land of Zion shall not be accounted as a wise steward. This is also an ensample or an example, right? Okay, so, so I, I think that this is the way judgment works, being in Zion, being able to get into Zion, or be, being able to get into the Lord's rest. And, and that is, and I was just going over this with someone online today in a comment section on, on another episode of Quick Show, and it, it was basically this, that exaltation, especially all degrees of glory to some de degree, no pun intended there, but it's, but exaltation especially is a very social state. And what I mean by that is think about how you progress. It's all through other people. It's your action. It's giving your will to the Lord, your agency, your stewardship. But it's all through other people. So, for example, it's the service, the love, the charity that you offer others, right? The other way around. It's the ability to receive from others their service, their love, and their charity that benefits you and helps you to move forward. Uh, how about forgiveness? We know from the words of, the, of, of Jesus that you only get so far if you are judgmental of others and you can't let go of things. If you can't forgive others, that's the platinum rule I go over, where, again, the golden rule would be um, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But the platinum rule is do unto others as you would have the Lord do unto you. That's a very clear principle and law of the gospel. The way that you treat others, the way that you judge others, whether or not you forgive others, that is the way you're going to be treated from the Lord. And, and so, it, again, it's a social thing. All of these things are, it's a very social state of being. It's, it's done 
as a group. It's done with other people. No man or woman is an island. And here I think what that's saying is that certificate, it's kind of like here are the people that I have served, that I have received service from, that I have forgiven, that have forgiven me. It's kind of like that. And I, and I think that, and, and I've read this in different places from the pulpit, that that's how it's going to be, right? You're going to be in front of other people that you share your life with. And what you have done for them and what they have done for you. And, and that is how you become one. That's how you become a Zion people where they're being appointed to go to. But a very, very social state. Okay, 73, just real quick. This has been about six weeks that Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon have been out about preaching the gospel, smoothing things over with the residents there. Uh, we do have a little comment here from Sidney Rigdon that we get about section 73 here. It says, a revelation to Joseph and Sidney. This is written down in a manuscript for, for section 73. A revelation, and it's in the handwriting of Sidney Rigdon. A revelation to Joseph and Sidney, the word of the Lord unto them concerning the elders of the church of the living God established in the last days, making known the will of the Lord unto the elders, what they shall do until conference. The conference is referring here to what they're going to hold here. This is January 10th in section 73. Two more weeks uh, on January 25th, they're going to be having a conference in Amherst, Ohio. It's about 50 miles away from here. So they have done what they needed to do in, in, with, in speaking with the other residents and preaching the gospel. And now they're going to get back to translating. Verse 3, Now verily I say unto you, my servants Joseph Smith, Jr. and Sidney Rigdon, saith the Lord, it is expedient to translate again. And inasmuch as it is practicable, and this is, by the way, the word of the Lord here, using the term translate. Again, we don't, uh, this is used very differently in the early 1800s. And, and, and he's not taking this from one language to another. That's not what the translation is. He, he's taking it and expounding on it based on what he receives from the Spirit, right? And inasmuch as it is practicable to preach in the regions round about until conference, and after that it is expedient to continue the work of translation until it be finished, which it does not end up being fully finished. So when they do begin translating again, one of the first things they translate is 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In fact, verse 1 of section 74 here which is about 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, is a, an exact copy of what we get in the Bible, right? In the Ch King James Version, it says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Remember, you can say, well, why would that have anything to do with whether the kids are holy? It, it has a lot to do with whether the kids are holy because if there's someone striving after holiness and the ordinances in the home that's a parent, then they are hopefully transmitting that to their kids. Holy means to be sacred or set apart, right? So they're, they're making things a little different based on their actions, based on their love, based on that, what they're teaching the kids. So this is the same policy that we have today in the church, that if you have an unbelieving spouse, you're not supposed to go and get a divorcement, right? That's not, that's not the recommendation of the church. As long as, as long as the kids are allowed to be taught the gospel and to be members of the church and to be in activity, right? That's the same policy we have today that Paul gave in his time in 1 Corinthians. So let's just go over this. We use, we use the example of circumcision here. Remember in the time of Paul, this is after the time of Jesus. And, and so those that are still getting circumcised under the law of Moses are not being brought up then in a, uh, they're not being brought up in a, a Christian tradition. So this is what it says in verse 3. And it came to pass that there arose a great contention among the people. This is in the time of, of Paul. 
concerning the law of circumcision. For the unbelieving husband was desirous that his children should be circumcised and become subject to the law of Moses, which law was fulfilled. So here's the problem, right? The It's kind of like when we are... Um, you know, if we were to, if, if you were to have your kids all be baptized into another religion, it's the same idea as circumcision. It's like an ordinance, and it's a commitment. It's part of a covenant to what? To the law of Moses. So that's a problem, right? That means that's that's that means that the parent, the father in this case, is a is unbelieving and is going to be committing his kids to the law of Moses and not to the law of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So verse 4, And it came to pass that the children, being brought up in subjection to the law of Moses, gave heed to the traditions of their fathers and believed not the gospel of Christ. Right? It's competing. Wherein they became unholy. So why were they unholy? It's not because they're bad people. It's not because they're going to be judged greater. It's because of they're not set apart under the ordinances of the gospel of Christ. They're not set apart uh, in the traditions of Christianity. So in this example here, and we can use this metaphorically today, if one of the parents is insisting that the kids follow a different tradition and not the church, not the gospel of Jesus Christ, then you've got a different issue there. It's, it's a completely different scenario than if the unbelieving parent or spouse is is willing to let the kids be brought up in the church. Still policy today. Okay, and then 75, uh, this is the conference that we were just talking about that happens a couple weeks later on January 25th, 1832 in Amherst, Ohio. A couple of things on this. Verse 3, Behold, I say unto you that it is my will that you should go forth and not tarry. Neither be idle, but labor with your might. That is a universal principle for all of us. And, and that's given to us right in the story of Adam and Eve. Right? You're going to work by the sweat of your brow. You need to work and not be idle. That's important. We are we're creators. We are learning to be creators like our heavenly parents. And so that means laboring. That means creating. That means being productive. And again, we get the response of those that do labor, right? And thus, if ye are faithful, ye shall be laden with many sheaves and crowned with honor and glory and immortality and eternal life. Now, is it right to seek after those things? Yes, it is. Those are righteous desires for growth and for for, um, a state of hope, right? Faith, hope, and charity. Because... The, the wonderful thing about the gospel is that you can hope for those things and not that growth and that increased well-being and state of mind and closeness to the Lord. And one of the reasons you can do that without worrying about it or being guilty about it is because, again, how do you get there? It's a social state of being. It's, a, it's social production for the most part. That's the most important thing. You are helping others. That's how you grow. You are helping others. That's how you're being Christ-like. And another statement, again, that you know I like, verse 16, and he who is faithful shall overcome all things. That is something we should be striving for. We're not victims. That is the exact opposite of accepting yourself as a victim. He who is faithful shall overcome all things. That's what the Lord wants. That's what your baptismal ordinance represents, part of it. That's what the Lord did. That's what he wants for you. And he shall be lifted up like the brazen serpent, like the resurrection at the last day. And then down in 22, we get another Reference to this, therefore gird up your loins and be faithful, and ye shall overcome all things. That is a goal of ours. That's what we need to do. Overcome all things and be lifted up at the last day. And then in 29, about being idle again. Let every man be diligent in all things, and the idler shall not have place in the church. 
except he repent and mend his ways. This is a sin to be idle. So we need to work. Now, part of the context for this, by the way, in 75, is Joseph Smith being ordained as the uh, high priest, right? Let's see the exact words that we get here in the summary of 75. The occasion was a conference at which Joseph Smith was sustained and ordained president of the high priesthood. Now, we have different levels of that. The president of the high priesthood is the president of the church. Right, of the Melchizedek priesthood. The high priesthood is the Melchizedek priesthood. We also have presidents of the high priesthood at a stake level. So the president of the stake presidency is also a president of the high priesthood over the stake. The stake is a Melchizedek priesthood unit. And this is what Orson Pratt said about this event. He said, at this conference, the prophet Joseph was acknowledged president of the high priesthood and hands laid on him by Elder Sidney Rigdon. So it's kind of like having Oliver Cowdery do the baptism with Joseph Smith. It's not somebody that's higher than him. It's actually somebody that's lower. Today, you have the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. The next, you know, when, when there's a new prophet, it's going to be the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. The new president uh, of the Quorum of the Twelve, that will be laying his hands upon the new prophet's head, right? That's the same, same thing that's happening here with Sidney Rigdon. At this conference, by the request of the priesthood, the prophet inquired of the Lord, and a revelation was given and written in the presence of the whole assembly. So he's actually there with everybody uh, in the assembly at the conference receiving this revelation, maybe through prayer. I, I don't know the history on this appointing many of the elders to missions, among whom Elder Lyman E. Johnson and myself were named and appointed on a mission to the eastern states. And I think there's two, actually two different sections of this revelation, two different revelations that were given here. So that's kind of the context, right? So this whole idea about don't idle, don't be idle. And, and before, uh, in the previous sections, what is your stewardship? And overcome the world. Don't be a victim. You need to overcome the world and be lifted up at the last day. This is, this is the story of the gospel. What, is this, what does the gospel mean? God, the term gospel comes from the Old English God spell, which means good tidings or the good word or the good news. And what is the good news? The good news is that Jesus suffered and died for you so that you can overcome the world and be lifted up at the last day. So I love that about that, that context where Joseph Smith is being sustained and, and ordained as the president of the high priesthood, the president of the church, and all of these ideas about stewardship and being and working and laboring and and succeeding and being victorious are all kind of combined in with all of that. I'll talk to you next time.